Now, uh, before we start our Q&A, there's a couple of things. This is my favorite part of a forum. And the reason why this is my favorite part of a forum is because, you know, I'm on the board of Brooklyn for Peace. And I think that Brooklyn for Peace is a really remarkable organization. And it's a remarkable organization because we deal with war, no war, and social justice and respect for humanity. We're non-sectarian. We're, uh, you know, we don't tell you this is what you, suppose you should do. We educate. We want you to be able to make your own choices. We take the militarization of this country, which we're getting so close, I mean, it's unbelievable that we can tell people in Boston not to come out of their houses, mm -hmm. and we don't, they don't do it. Mm -hmm. yeah. So what, what about all that? That to yeah. me is militarization. That's like a military mentality, mm -hmm. right? That's connected to war. Mm -hmm. What is that? The cost of war, it costs so much. How does that affect us? Well, it affects us by cuts programs. You know, arts, we're, we're going to start a whole, uh, uh, I forget the word you would use to, a campaign for the Arts and Culture Committee. And we're going to post some uh, uh, online things where you can go online and sign. We want to do a lot of lobbying this year to tell Congress and tell our representatives to stop putting all this money into the military and put it back into arts and education. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I remember as a kid, we had a band. There was a band in our school, and it, it was banned in almost any school, whether or not you had a lot of money or not. So uh, we want to be able to empower our future, which is the children, with art and culture. And without it, we become a civilization of just banging and killing people and not really acknowledging the humanness in another, in another person. And we see it now. Arts and culture are coming out of the schools, and what are we doing? We're fighting everybody all the time. So, getting back to my point, Brooklyn for Peace, we take this concept of a military society of war, and we combine it and connect it through all these different committees that we have. We have committees that are Israel-Palestine, Latin America, peace and economic justice, which deals with a lot of the domestic issues. We have a peace fair, climate action. Believe it or not, all of these committees are tied in to a military complex, to a spending of money on murdering and killing, and not really truly for empowering human beings. So Brooklyn for Peace is unique as an organization because of that. We tie all this in. There's a lot of grassroots organizations that have very specific agendas. But we are very different than any of the uh, peace organizations you'll find. And because of that, if you loved and enjoyed this, uh, this evening of what you saw, we'd like to do a lot of forums. We'd like to be able to have a lot of really cool cookies and juice and stuff for you to drink. And we want to be able to stay. We're coming up on 30 years. Uh, as Brooklyn for Peace. And I would like the Brooklyn for Peace, uh, since it started as uh, four parents, Brooklyn parents for peace, parents that were concerned about their children, I'd like for it to be here for the rest of the future. Anybody who happens to have kids, I'd like for it to be around. And we need your help. We need you to help us. We really do. And we count on you, and this is where it's my favorite part, because I'm on the fundraising committee. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going to pass around a donation jar. And please give what you can. And also think about becoming a Brooklyn for Peace member. Our lowest is $30 a year. Now I'm going to break that down to you. And I'm going to break it down to you as 12 cents a week or 58 cents a day. <laughs> So I know if you, I, I did the math, it's, it's somewhere around that, right? It's, did I do it backwards? Not backwards. Yeah, okay, well anyway, I'm a jazz musician, what do I know? They pay me nothing, I go in and I play all night and they give me a crappy. But in any case, it's only $30, so if you look at it as a dollar a day, we, that makes it easier for me to comprehend. Uh, become a member, that way you're on our newsletter, uh, you can find out what's going on, you can come to more of these things, and you'll be helping us stay around. You'll be helping you stay around. And so, with that being said, I want to see some people become members. I know some, a lot of you are. Uh, and just, just um, 
do that. Also, a little plug for arts and culture. We're always looking for people to be a part of our committee. We need artists all the time, all the time, all the time. <laughs> I did. Could I speak to the money thing? Yeah, please, yeah, no, please. I, I mean, please. give to Brooklyn for Peace, and I'm going to when I go over and get my purse in a minute, but um, I promise. But, um, you know, David Koch, the Koch brothers, are giving billions of dollars to the arts, right, in New York City. Uh, they know the importance of a kind of meaningless artistic experience, art, art as, as uh, oblivion. Um, and. You know, we are being starved out, the, the, the political artists. The censorship in this country, and there is tremendous censorship in this country, and it is all economic censorship. Um, I was just turned down for a grant because the fossil fuel lobbyists in my new play, who only do what fossil fuel lobbyists have done, are too evil to put on stage, according to a foundation that supposedly funds plays about science, right? But their, but their mission is science and industry. So they don't want to fund plays about global warming. They want to fund plays about, uh, you know, fracking and, and you know, the, the, the glories. And, but the, the, we are up against this all the time, and I think every artist in this room, and Brooklyn for Peace is also up against it, that, that, that economic censorship is the name of the game. Um, and we are, you know, who sits on the boards of theaters? The boards of theaters are the, the CEOs from Chase and Citibank and Exxon, and, and so they are making decisions about what kind of plays they will fund, and everybody falls in line. It, if you happen to watch the Tonys, and you couldn't tell the, the difference between the award ceremonies and the commercials, right? <laughs> um, because they were all selling mindlessness, and you know, um, you, can, you can see it. Uh, the taking uh, arts out of the school is part of this. The dumbing down, um, the destroying of public libraries, even the destruction of the post office, which is a, a community gathering place in many, in many towns, especially in rural places. The destruction of the commons, where you can't gather. There's no place to gather. This is what they're fighting for in Turkey right now, right? Is a common space with trees against you know, an autocratic uh, uh, regime. And this is going on all over, but, but, you know, economic censorship is what we're up against. And I don't have the answer to that, because mainly what we spend our time doing is trying to raise money. Uh, you know, um, uh, but, but that's what's going on. And so don't for a minute think that we're not being censored. We are being heavily, heavily, heavily censored. Yeah, well, thank you for that. Okay, and I appreciate everyone who has contributed, really. Thank you so much. Now, before we start the q and I just wanted to introduce a young man, uh, Kevin Augustine with uh, Lone Wolf. We've done a lot of work with him. He's a great puppet master. He makes these, well, I'm going to let you tell everybody what you do, but it's, it's really pretty remarkable to see him in action. So he's just going to take a couple of minutes, you know, just to, because we have a gig. We're going to be doing a gig with him in March of 2014. Uh, Brooklyn for Peace is going to work with him on that. So, yeah, I didn't plan on speaking Yeah, to just you know, so, a minute or two. Don't okay. get like crazy like an artist. Uh, uh, I'm not quite that type of artist. I'm used to <laughs> writing and being in the studio, so I, I mostly talk through my work. And I'm not great extemporaneously, but uh, uh, contemporary puppet theater company, creating an original work uh, it's for adults. And uh, kind of like Spirit Child was talking about, we deal with issues that uh, deserve deeper attention kind of beneath the headlines, uh, stories, and, and characters. And I partner with puppets, life-size puppets, because uh, two reasons. Uh, as a kid, I always work with them, and there's, there's a magic to them. And uh, an audience is just kind of like seeing a puppy or a baby. You just It's pure, and it grabs your attention. And so they're great partners to get attention for stories and content that deserve more. Um, and so with, and what I'm doing that's new for me, challenging myself, is to um, kind of branch out from my norm, theater community, uh, downtown crowd, and making partnerships, Brooklyn for Peace, Veterans for Peace, and trying to uh, kind of, we have shared missions in, in some of the work that I'm doing in raising awareness about issues of cost of war, 
how to forge a path of peace, nonviolence, and I deal with it in kind of non-traditional ways. So the play that we're partnering on um, is a combination of, of clowning and magic and pantomime that deals with these issues, and uh, particularly looking at a correlation between um, the cost of war and, and that happens with veterans and civilians, and partnering that with uh, uh, pit bull, dog fighting, and the history of that, uh, because uh, that's legal. And citizens all around the world have said, it's inhumane, it's barbaric, but in terms of violence with training ourselves to kill other humans, that we say, well, there's not much you can do about that. So uh, there's an empathy in one place, and there's kind of a shrug in the shoulders in the other. So um, trying to find a new perspective to, to look at these issues. So uh, we have a show coming up in March. So we're going to open the floor up for questions. And uh, I guess since we're such a nice little small intimate group, you can just kind of raise your hands. And uh, woo, that was quick. <laughs> All right, I, OK, I saw a boom, bang, no, I saw a boom, bang, bang. Ask you, about, you, you mentioned political prisoners. You do work with political prisoners or, or about prison, or I, you know, could you clarify? Yeah, so we do a lot of um, recording projects around political prisoners. So we work with, um, on a move in Philly, Mumia, Abu Jamal. Mm -hmm. um, right now we're doing some stuff from Russell Maroon Schultz, mm -hmm. um, as well as Tariq Mahana, mm -hmm. and any other political prisoner that we come across that could mm -hmm. use more attention through our tools. And, and what do you do, actually? I mean well, we fundraise for them. through our like So we have CDs that we make. And then we partner with the organizations and pr provide them with the CDs to sell at fundraisers or events or whatever the case is to get the information out, number one, and two, to raise money, like we talk about sustainability for organizations. So you and write, learn from you write them songs too. Of, you write songs about their cases yes. and, and record them and then, mm -hmm. yeah, great. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. great. Um, so I think you already asked. Well, I was just wondering if anybody has an inspiring story that comes to mind of a breakthrough or a victory because, uh, because these are difficult times and, uh, and, it's, and our lobby is not as powerful as many lobbies and voices. So I'm, I'm wondering if you could reach back or forward or within or without and find something that, a, a moment that you remember that was uh, really shedding light in the some kind of breakthrough? Uh, I have been in my, you know, I don't think we're going to have a mass movement tomorrow, unfortunately. But, but twice in my life that has happened. Maybe, well, certainly twice in my life. Because I said the first anti-war march I went on against the war in Vietnam was 25 people, literally. And that was in 1963. And, you know, so you can do the... You can do the math. But in 1979, I was one of 11 War Resisters League uh, members who were arrested on the front lawn of the White House uh, because we held up a banner that said, no nuclear power, no nuclear weapons, USA, USSR. And you couldn't do this anymore. We went, we went on the White House tour, and we stepped over the little, uh, <laughs> uh, and we walked onto the lawn. And we were there for 30 seconds before they arrested us. Um, and uh, we were on a six-week trial in Washington, D.C., where we were all found guilty. And it was the first time I had heard the police officers lie under oath. Um, and they testified, one by one, that we had climbed a six-foot fence and jumped down and ran across the White House lawn, and that's why they busted us, because we looked so dangerous. Um, literally, that's what they said under oath. Um, and we were all found guilty. But that was 1979, and there were 11 of us. In 1982, there were a million people on the streets of New York in an anti-nuclear march. So I have seen it happen. I have seen it happen go from a very small to a very large. What we've ultimately won <laughs> is not that much. You know, we're, we're in a more heavily militarized zone, I think, than ever before right now. Uh, but, but I do think that you never know when what you do will have a tremendous effect. And just to speak to Spirit Child's work, what, what you do for the prisoners is having a tremendous effect on them. And it's giving them a kind of courage to sustain really inhuman treatment. 
um, and that's very important too. And it's and it's giving their families support and their friends, and and it's setting them an, an example of of you know courage uh, that is really important. So I don't think we can always say you know count on mass you know say we have to affect masses in order to do something uh, meaningful. Um, but we don't know what history you know we don't know the moment when people will all oh <laughs> you know. Mm-hmm. Okay, so it was directed to Karen. That was question was. Well, or was it directed to it anybody directed else on the yeah, panel that wanted to? It was directed to anybody on yeah. the panel. Okay. This, yeah, I could, I definitely, I'm into like small victories too. Yeah. Um, uh, so the cop watch um, and, you know, being there in the community and, you know, hoping that an instance of brutality doesn't occur with the mm-hmm. interactions, yeah. right? Um, so we've diffused a lot of situations. Yeah. We've also, like, um, with the cards and the information that we give out in the community, people know their rights, so they'll say, yeah, I don't consent to this search. Right? Uh, Mumia Abu Jamal, who's not in death row anymore, um, general population, that's a huge victory for a movement. Um, yes, um, and also Maroon Schultz, July 6th, we tend to have a party because he's going to be from solitary confinement to general population, and he'll be building with Mumia Abu Jamal, yeah, yeah, in Pennsylvania, that's huge. And that's all because of the pressure campaign um, and this book that's been touring. Uh, a lot of that's coming from the people, right? So people are like, oh, man, you know, all right, you got to do something. Like, this brother's, like, locked down. And, um, but the recruiting center that I mentioned earlier, like, being out in a recruiting center and making sure that people don't sign up uh, to get involved with the U.S. forces um, in, that, in that respect, but little victories along the way, too. Yeah, I think, I mean, I've always been, you know, every penny it counts towards a dollar. Um, and if you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem. Um, so, like, yeah, it's definitely, we are, like, with Arts and Bushwick, our main goals are small, many impacts. But we know that those impacts are gonna be building off and then, you know, those students are gonna know and they're gonna appreciate what they grew up having. Just like I grew up appreciating what I had. Some volunteers came and taught me about artwork. Um, and so we're hoping, you know, of course it's going to pay it forward. And we have huge plans for the future, like a mentorship program for juniors and seniors in high school. Um, so yeah, it's just many impacts that will definitely evolve over. They're still impacting somebody. Okay, uh, Spirit Child student, I believe you have a question. Oh, yes, always. Oh, 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 <laughs> <laughs> By the way, this is great. I love this. Um, my question is, because I see, like, more police than art programs in my school. Mm-hmm. My question to you is, do you think without art, the world would come at peace? No way. <laughs> no. Without art, the world will not come to peace. Absolutely. No. <laughs> no. I mean, there's a reason that they're taking arts out mm-hmm. of the school. It's, a, it's, it's very calculated. Mm-hmm. And it's not that there's no money. <laughs> there's plenty of money around, you know. Um, but it's being used to oppress us. Uh, and, and one good way to do that is put police in the school and take out the arts. Yeah, yeah. Because, you know. And they don't have to regulate that. Yeah, right. I mean, you know. You yeah, art is free. You can tap everybody's phone, but you can't have a gun register. You know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> all right. It, it involves your free thinking. Art. Opens up, uh, uh, as as Karen had in- mentioned earlier, your heart. You know, your heart. The heart is the most powerful. The heart mm-hmm. is the thing that actually accomplishes a goal. You know, you can think about it, you can focus on it, but that heart is that real desire. That it's like you fall in love with this thing, and it's a love that is. Oh, I think about you day and night. I can't live without you. It is such a powerful thing. And the heart is what uh, people respond to. And art is the one thing that opens that up. So why would you want to have a society that you promote that ability to communicate with people that way through the heart? Why? Why would you want that? You know, I mean, I would want it, but I'm just saying it, it comes down to that. But yeah, absolutely. So do you have anything else to say on that? or? I shouldn't even be interjecting. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm not on the panel. So uh, you were the next person, I think. So, and, uh, yeah. So just thank you guys for coming. It was really fun to kind of hear, you know, three different people and three different kind of trajectories as to how to 
you know, how to make art and activism kind of work together. It's something that's been close to, to my heart for probably the last 21 years. Um, when I was 12, I got into punk rock and um, learned about activism kind of through that. Um, so two things I wanted to say. First is an announcement. Um, so I have a, a nonprofit organization called Loka Shakti, which means power of the people um, in Sanskrit. Uh, I live in Harlem. Um, and we're trying to build a, a social media site for activists, specifically for activists. It's intentionally non-corporate, doesn't have commercial, uh, you know, ad advertising. Um, and something that really kind of promotes people getting together. Um, but as an artist, and, and because art was really kind of the thing that, that drove me to do it, one of the things that we wanted to do as a way to promote the site, but also just in general, is uh, we're starting these blogs, um, four blogs so far, to promote arts and activism. So protest music, protest lit, protest art, and protest film. And we have all these domains, so it's like protestart.org, protestmusic.org. Um, so that's kind of the idea. And so I just wanted to kind of invite everybody to check it out. And if you want to write articles, we need people to write articles um, about ways in which people are using uh, the arts to, to promote kind of, you know, social media. So I'm going to pass that up. Fly. Okay, great. Yes, I was going to ask you if you have sure. to pass yeah. those around. Um, okay. Yeah, so it would be great if, if anybody wants to write. Mm -hmm. Really cool. Um, the second one is something that I'd, I'd like to ask each of you. What do you think your most effective work of political art has been so far? And effective might be kind of a, a difficult word because, um, you know, maybe you didn't, like, someone didn't come up to you and was like, dude, you changed my life. But, you know, but may, or maybe if, if uh, what's, the, what's something, the, the work you're most proud of in terms of politics, the way you're kind of able to combine politics and art, or if we could check out one thing from each of you, what would it be? Um, I guess for me, it would be the organizing of Community Day. It was our one thing that we really wanted was to bridge communities together. We've had struggles as an organization to bridge communities together. It's always been kind of more catered to the young artists coming into the neighborhood. And we've unfortunately been neglecting the people who have been living there the entire time. Um, and this was kind of, it was perfect that we had all these organizations that were already helping the people. So they were, the people already knew these organizations and partnering with us, they were more familiar and more comfortable. And then also, you know, us bringing artwork out into the community instead of having the community forced to come into a gallery or a, a cold, <coughs> intimidating museum bringing it out to the community is more opening and welcoming and everyone there you know we had a huge amount of community members already there because it, we it was in Maria Hernandez Park which is kind of a heart of Bushwick um, so it was definitely very awe-inspiring to see all of the community members already there um, it wasn't exactly what we wanted because it was our first year so we didn't get to make all the relationships that we wanted to but we do have the potential to grow exponentially for next year and the following years, and we've already started making relationships with the schools because of the organization or the event. And like I said, we want to do more work with the students, the youth, and the community, and help them out as well. But you can only see that once a year, so. <laughs> uh, so I always hope I'm most proud of the most recent work. So I hope. I'll be proud of extreme weather this time next year. But uh, the, the another life I'm I'm really proud of in a, in many many ways. First of all, as I said, it is the only American play that does tell the truth about the torture program in this country. And I know that not only because I worked with a lot of original documents, testimonies from torture victims that were given to me by lawyers, but also that we've had all the most of the major players. Um, for the detainees and, and the anti-torture voices in this country come and speak after the play, and they have all loved the play. Michael Ratner from Center for Constitutional Rights said to me, I was captivated from beginning to end with the play. So I'm proud of that, but I'm also proud, and I'm proud that we had the courage to do this, and mainly it's George. Uh, I wouldn't be doing it without George. You need a partner. Um, and I'm proud of our cast, and. We started the play in Kosovo, and when we did it in Kosovo, one of our actresses' uncle had been tortured to death during the war, right? And when we just did the play again, uh, one of our actresses playing the same part, 
her grandfather was tortured during the Cultural Revolution in China, uh, and she grew up with the legacy of the effect of his torture on her mother and on her. So you're never very far from torture. Um, it's right there all the time. I'm also very proud of the way that when Tamar Mahana came to speak about his brother, the audience stayed for an extra hour and 15 minutes. They couldn't get enough of the story um, that we've been able to take a work of art and then link it to specific people's uh, tales. So uh, we're taking the play to London and we'll see, we just have two performances, but um, uh, we'll see what happens there. I, w I would also say that I'm proud of the fact that we've done this play three times when no established theater in this country would touch the play. We have done it on our own, two crowdfunding uh, things, uh, money that we sold a piece, the only piece of land we've ever owned, we sold um, <laughs> to, put, to put it into the play. Um, we've, we've done it, you know, like that, um, because we both felt we had to do this play. Um, and uh, whenever, and we also refused to ha have it reviewed, which I'm also proud of, <laughs> because we didn't want it killed. We wanted it to live on the reputation and the word of mouth that it was gathering and getting. And so we ran it totally on word of mouth again with thanks to Charlotte and Brooklyn for Peace because Charlotte became one of our early supporters and stayed with the play the whole time. And I don't know how many times you saw it, but a lot of times. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, we, we, so it really was a grassroots effort. And for all those reasons, I'm proud of it. I'm also proud of it, one more thing, that the actors feel proud of it and have said to me that they feel stronger because they've done this play. And they've grown both artistically and also uh, as, as people. This is all another life? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm proud of um, Monique Scott, Freebrook Academy. Yay. Um, part of uh, Movement in Motion as well, right? And the time and development that we, we spent um, and the many hours and retreats and stuff that we've been doing. And that all came from uh, the connection of people, right? Um, and, 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 and believing in people and working with people and, and supporting in our community. Um, so the personal development and like connection. So if you don't know Freebrook Academy, you could talk to her, she's, she's right here. Um, and I'm also proud of my students who are here um, and, and the work that they do with their art. Um, you can also talk to them about when they're performing next and what they're doing. Um, for me, that's the most uh, import, important part uh, of, of the work that I do as, as a human being, like the personal connections and seeing what other people are creating through that and being able to be around that energy and light. So um, I appreciate that um, as well as, you know, Rike right here, Chapter 9, uh, Brooklyn, Zulu Nation. You know, I'm proud of my brother there for holding it down and doing a lot of things in community work, uh, People Survival Program, feeding the people during uh, Hurricane Sandy and went out to Coney Island and uh, Red Hook and, and um, different communities and places and Far Rockaway and we just put the work in. So the people or the things that I'm most proud of are like all in this room, you know, so that makes me very happy. <laughs> Excellent. Um, and we have time for like, I guess maybe, how many people want to ask questions? It's just, uh, I know you, okay, so two people, okay, so two questions, oh, three? Oh, okay, well, what I wanted to do is I also wanted to be able to give enough time so that we could have, you know, cookies and juice, and you could actually go around and talk to different people and communicate. So you tell me how you want this to go. Do you, should we continue with the questions and you grab your cookies and run? Or <laughs> what time do we have to be out? We have to be out of here shortly. I just wanted to make sure. That's fine. You know, okay. Uh, I think you were next and then you and you. I know you. <laughs> oh, yes. No, I did. So, uh, so actually, uh, Pisces, you had raised your hand and then you raised yours. And then, so, Pisces, please go ahead. Okay, then. Um, I now was here for all of the meeting, but what I gathered was you are an art group that defends the people, bottom line. Um, at this time, with what's happening in regards to uh, Edward Snowden, you know, and um, we now have another secrecy disclosure. That is the Trans-Pacific Partnership. I don't know if you heard about it. And to me, 
it's a real heart-rending situation and you know culminating both things it seems like we are going in this downhill manner uh, what do you see in terms of a project that would make the American people plus the world become more aware of how vicious the Trans-Pacific Partnership is? I don't know if you know about it, but if you want, I just read one paragraph of it. The Trans-Pacific Partnership is a trade agreement the U.S. is negotiated, negotiating with 11 other nations in total secrecy. It gives foreign corporations the power to sue our government when our law blocked toxic business projects and mm -hmm. export. It also rewards businesses that offshore more jobs, drive down salaries to the lowest level, and finish off the union and much more. So do you see this as being important in a way that you could use your art to, uh, you know, kind of like save us? <laughs> Are, are you, who are you asking the question? I really was just asking. Uh, I don't know anybody in particular who I want to address. Well, you know, Hannah Arendt, who lived during the Nazi era, um, said that uh, she coined the phrase the banality of evil. That's another. There's a wonderful film about her being shown right now at, at um, uh, Film Forum called Hannah Arendt. But, but she said, and I'm paraphrasing, that that if there were no people who resisted tyranny, there would be no hope. And the, what, what gave her some hope, even during Nazism, um, were, the, were the people who resisted. So uh, I, I think we're part of a historical continuum uh, in which it is necessary to resist. It, it doesn't mean that we will be successful in my lifetime maybe not even in yours. But if we don't resist, uh, we for sure won't be successful. So as uh, you know, Megan said, uh, you know, um, so you know, it, the, res the act of resistance is important. And just you know, the, the, the factory um, disaster that killed 1,100 garment workers um, so that people in this country can buy seven more t-shirts at below cost you know, uh, from Walmart. Um, the, the, I, I think outside of this country, consciousness is much higher than inside mm -hmm. this country. So I think we have to be aware that we're part of a world, uh, not, not, you know, and, and I, I'm sure you are, you are because of what you're bringing up. So I think we have to also rely on, on other, you know, the, the rest of our colleagues around the world who are much hipper than we are about many issues. Um, and are do and are really resisting on the front lines about m many many issues and, and make those you know make those connections. But <coughs> yeah, um, yeah, the corporations want to own us all. This is this is the big goal. Yeah, yeah. And they're close to they're close, but they're not yet there. Yeah. I think um, music projects, you know, uh, workshops, like we do a lot of discussions, like the stuff that I talked about earlier, political information and education and sharing. Um, on the actual CD um, for Tadek, we have, because um, we have a chapter in Germany and a chapter in Czech Republic of Movement in Motion, and we found all these people in connections through issues, right? And we learned, okay, police brutality is not just happening here. And I like what you were saying about being like global. Um, so one is like having teachings with ourselves and being creative about it and documenting it in some way, a film project, music project, a theater project, a play or whatever it is, and then finding those like-minded people throughout, right? Because that's affecting all of us, not just our community in New York City, right? Um, and then finding out how it relates to them and putting it together. Because that's how we dialogue and inform ourselves. Otherwise, we don't know what's happening and how that community is affected by this particular issue. Um, so I would say, you know, we could talk after and we could figure out how the youth that we work with and other people that we're around can like create a song or something about it and then start that dialogue. Did you want to comment? Or I mean, I agree with both of you. Um, there's always power in numbers, and artists tend to be very emotional people, and we also are very charismatic, where people will come towards you, and they want to hear what you have to say, and I think um, all of us would agree that we are trying to educate a lot of people, so it's knowledge is power, and again, you know, with
power comes also with numbers. So just having the uh, being an artist and being charismatic and having people being drawn towards you, you have that ability and that power and even responsibility to start letting people know what is up um, and start from there. <coughs> Okay, um, you yeah, have the question? Oh, I just wondered, is your price still being played now? And Unfortunately, no, no, no is the answer. It's not being played now, uh, no. Uh, We're, is there a possibility in the future? I would love there to be a possibility in the future. Right now, we don't see one. We're, we're taking it to London. Um, and then we're going to put our efforts here in producing the play called Extreme Weather, W-H-E-T-H-E-R, which is asking uh, the questions about climate change. Um, uh, because we've, we've sort of exhausted our possibilities of getting another life on. At the same time, we feel it should be running. We, we really feel committed to the artistry of the play uh, in every way, the acting, the <coughs> design, um, the script, yes. Uh, uh, we think it should be running, but as I said, we have not. Theaters have written to me and said, oh, send me your play. I know we'll want to do it, and I never hear from them again. Never. Um, there is just tremendous censorship going on, and a lot of it is self-censorship. You're not hearing it from this panel, um, but many artists out there know how far they can go, and they won't go further because they want that big contract, they want that big production, they want that film thing, you know, and, and they do it that way. Um, so there is there is just a lot more censorship of the arts, and I've always said it's not a problem with the audience. Our problem is finding the audience because we run for a month, right? Mm -hmm. And we know that there are hundreds of other people who would love to see the play, but, but we can't find them in a month. You know, um, so it's not a problem with audience, but it's a problem with the with the the producers and the money people who sit between the artists and the audience and make those judgments and make those those calls. And in this country, I'm sorry, but just one other thing: in this country, since the Cold War, I, I'm, I'm sorry, since since the McCarthy period, there has been a feeling that political art is bad art. And this is what people are taught, and they're taught you can't be a political artist. That's not true in the rest of the world. In the rest of the world, everybody knows that art is political in, a, in its nature, and art has been involved in revolution. I mean, Nelson Mandela, when he was in prison, his 70th birthday, there was a, there was a concert um, that millions of people all over the world listened to, a concert in honor of his 70th birthday, and it was one big reason he was let out of prison because there was such a public focus on this great man who, who was in prison, right? Um, and he understood the power of music, and he's always been a big supporter of, of music. Um, so, you know, it, it's the censorship is the problem, so I'm sorry we're not running. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, and I think the final question is from Joel. Who is, you have a question. Actually, Joel and I are also on the Arts and Culture Committee as well as Charlene there in the back and uh, Sean, who is there. She supplied the sound system, but we didn't need it. Uh, and I'll just say one more time before I have Joel ask the question we can always use people on the Arts and Culture Committee. Mm -hmm. Always. Mm -hmm. Did you mention the next meeting being next Tuesday? Oh, it, our next meeting is <laughs> Tuesday. You, yeah, you help me, Charlotte. You've got to help me here. Right. It's Tuesday. Tuesday next week at 7 p.m. Next week at 7 p.m. At 7. Yes. Yeah, the third Tuesday of every month. Third Tuesday of every month. I should know this. Third Tuesday of every month. And if you go to our website, www.brooklynpeace.org, you can uh, go and email us at artist. You'll see a little thing, you just click on it, and you can send us an email, and we'll make sure you have all the information. Okay, so. Um, Karen's kind of talked a little bit about it, but I was wondering if everyone could talk about <coughs> being a radical artist that resists power and the consequences that come from choosing to address topics that are not going to be adopted in the mainstream, and how you stay strong in the face of it and continue to create? Well, my, I mean, um, me as a personal artist, I am not necessarily political based, and nor is Arts in Bushwick. 
Um, however, we do deal with again like gentrification and the you know changing of our society. <coughs> but um, we've gotten a lot of positive feedback, so I can't really say of any resistance other than our resistance towards the landowners and the corporal business owners that are just seeking profit. Um, there's also a lot of resistance from the bar owners that are new in the area. Um, but again, I'm always very pro, there's power in numbers, and if you have a strong enough voice, or you don't, you find someone else that does, and so I'm very big on sharing your opinions, your voices with other people, and getting more people to want to do the same things as you are, because chances are someone else wants to do it, um, and then you'll find someone else that wants to do it. Uh, like our first community arts and Bushwick meeting, it was just me and my partner. Um, but we stuck with it and we decided we're going to do this every other week, we're going to have a meeting, we're going to email a bunch of people even though they never respond and gradually we've been getting more and more people that want to do what we're doing. Um, so that's just always sharing mm -hmm. power numbers. So, you know, our collective movement in motion is straight up, like I mentioned earlier, against capitalism, white supremacy, patriarchy, uh, homophobia, sexism, all that stuff, right? Mm -hmm. So not only do we get heat from mm -hmm. places that we can't perform mainstream-wise, mm -hmm. but there's certain political spaces that won't even allow us to play because <laughs> of our ideology or the way we feel, mm -hmm. right? Um, some people don't want to be challenged, right? Mm -hmm. And we say, I don't care. <laughs> like, we're just going to keep doing what we're doing. Um, so it's spaces like this that keep us going, right? Like people that we see on a day-to-day -day that understand that it's cool, like you're my brother, you're my sister, we may not agree on everything, I'm gonna push you, you're gonna push me, I could be like, you know, way off, and that's cool, like bring me back, and it's my responsibility to do the same to you, right? Um, but uh, it's really hard to get that support, um, and then we're not even talking about financial support, we're just talking about emotional and yeah. that you know not getting a crazy look right <laughs> um just that support yeah. um but uh you know I, i'm for a lot of things and i'm not for many other things you know and that comes out a lot and even my comrades we have a lot of uh disputes but uh the what keeps us going is that we know we're against overall the destruction of this earth, right, and, and how that plays out. Mm -hmm. And um, we, we try to go at least those 80 miles together yeah. and then, you know, figure it out later when we win, yeah. right? <laughs> so. Yeah, well said, well said, well said. I, I don't think you do stay strong. You, you I mean, that's like, oh, I'm strong. Ah. Um, there are strategies. I like Cocker Spaniels and yoga, um, you know. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> You know, I think you, you, pick your, you pick yourself up again. And, and what, what ultimately keeps you going is the love of the work. And yeah, and the love of the work is the love of the earth and everybody on it. So mm -hmm. that's, that's pretty powerful. But it's, you know, everything, you know, I, I mean, the worst things that I could imagine have been said about me. If you Google me, if you go to, you know, you can find <laughs> all kinds of really, you know, terrible <laughs> comments. Um, also, wonderful thing, you know, I tend to get one or the other. Um, uh, but and ultimately, that's not so important. What's in, I've always said the people, the people who've come into my life because of the work I've done uh, have been the real, that's been the real uh, gift. And, and I think that's true. That's sort of what we're all saying. Mm -hmm. um, and they keep you strong. And they help you when you're down. And you help them when they're down. And, mm -hmm. Okay, there was uh, one young man, I think, uh, told Sean that he wanted to, okay, uh, Spirit Child's uh, student. <laughs> um, I wanted to ask, like, why do, you well, why do you think that in the mainstream, like, in the mainstream media, that, like, political topics never come up? <laughs> Yeah. That's a good question. Yeah. It's censorship. That's what censorship is. Um, we don't talk about the real things. We don't want you to know the real things. We don't want, you know, we want to sell cars and the latest prescription drug. 
Um, and we want you to be mindless. We want you to work three or four jobs with no <laughs> benefits <laughs> and not have time for your family, not have time to read, not have time for yourself, and just come home so exhausted that you turn on the television and you get, you know, more, more propaganda. Um, you know, it's a kind of, of slavery. It's in a kind of economic slavery, and it keeps us uh, in chains, so to speak. And there's a reason for that. Yeah. And you know, you know, you know it even by asking the question. You, by asking the question, you know the answer to it. Right? Mm -hmm. right. It shouldn't be that way. You know. Yeah. Anyone else wants to respond to that, or just? I, I just have a request okay. when, when we, uh, um, so I was saying earlier <laughs> about we're, we're arts and activism, right? Um, at some point when the questions are done and when we're, when we're done, if we could close up a creative <laughs> kind of happening yeah, sure. just so that we could, yeah. you know, have some of the yeah. art. Display okay, absolutely. That's just the right. request. Okay, so, we'll, all right, so that's what we'll do is we're going to uh, end the session at this point. Let's give our panel a <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, If you go to the Pacific website on our arts and culture page, we'll have uh, information and, and links that you can go to and check out and find out more information about our wonderful, wonderful panel. Thank you, guys. I mean, yeah. really. It was just, it's great. to other countries. We, we believe in citizen diplomacy. So many in the working peace group have they've gone to these countries. You know, we go there, we listen, we learn, we come back filled with hope and with new energy. And um, we've got to continue to do that. And when I, when I